afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to see such a, a large uh, standing room only crowd, as long as the bar marshal doesn't help, we're good. Uh, <laughs> we're so I'd like to introduce you to the, uh, uh, welcome you to the 2019 Viterbi keynote lecture, which is our annual lecture uh, series in which we recognize uh, and celebrate seminal contributions in, in the field of digital communications. So first I'd like to start by welcoming uh, Dr. Andrew Viterbi, our most distinguished alumnus and very generous supporter of the Viterbi School of Engineering. And of course, our fearless leader, Dean Janis Jorksos. Oh. <laughs> and finally, today's distinguished lecturer, Leonard Kleinrock, Professor of Computer Engineering, uh, uh, Computer Science at Crosstown at UCLA. Uh, among his many awards, he was a recipient of the National Medal of Science, which is our nation's highest high scientific offer, honor in 2007. Um, actually, we have the rare distinction of having two uh, National Medal of Science recipients here today, because Dr. Viterbi also received the Medal of Science, actually in the same year, in 2007. Um, and there are among only 62 recipients of this uh, medal in, in the field of mathematical, statistical, and computer sciences since its initiation in 1963. And I should add also that our, our late colleague, uh, Sol Galon, and one of Andrew's mentors when he was a student here, also received this award. So along, uh, among uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Kleinrock's many contributions uh, to, to communications and computer networks, Islam actually sent the first ever message over the internet, or the ARPANET as it was then, in 1969. And this event was celebrated in the fascinating, if somewhat idiosyncratic, uh, recent documentary, Lo and Behold, which was uh, directed by uh, Werner Herzog. I really recommend this as a, a, a very interesting uh, take on, on the, the connected world. So with that, let me hand over to my distinguished colleague, John Sylvester, Professor of Electrical Engineering and the former Vice Provost for Academic Computing here at USC who himself played a fundamental role in the development of research and educational computer networks across California and <laughs> So thank you, Richard, and uh, thanks very much for coming, Glenn. We really are honored to have you speaking with us today. Uh, and my interactions with Len go back a long time. I was one of his PhD students in the, uh, in the 70s. In fact, I first met him, I think it was in September 1973, as I took his course on queuing theory, which was 223A, I believe, at the time. And it was at 8 o'clock in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And he always taught his classes first thing in the morning. And this was a bit of a struggle for me, but it was great for Len because he likes to get up early. And he said, that way I can get my teaching out of the way and get down to my real work. So, fortunately, his, his uh, lecturing style was, was very entertaining, I would say, and also very thoughtful. And uh, so I enjoyed going to lectures. So I made most of them. I might have probably slept one or two, but uh, I think I made most of them. And uh, I ended up being part of his research group. And I worked on uh, packet radio networks, as they were in those days, which is sort of some of the forerunner technology for uh, Wi-Fi networks, uh, Ethernet networks, actually and uh, also really the basis for some of the things that we see in the, in the cellular network world as well. A lot of the early protocols were developed in Nigeria. But it was part of a group at UCLA that sort of coalesced around uh, Len and also uh, Gerald Estrin, who were there as well, in the late 60s. Uh, Len having gone to UCLA in, I think, uh, 1964, I believe, or 1963, when he finished his PhD. His PhD was uh, MIT. And uh, his PhD thesis was related to how can we build a mathematical framework to understand how this new idea of message or packet switch networks would operate, to try and understand how they would operate, what their performance would be. And it led to an understanding of how to go about designing those networks. Many of his students have worked with him over the years, worked on those areas of optimization. Of, of those networks or, or designing protocols to work in large-scale networks and many other aspects of what we today think of as the internet. And for most of the people in the audience, except for the front row, uh, probably never lived in a world when there wasn't an internet, but it was a very different world. <laughs> and it really has changed the world. And it's certainly 
the, the internet is in many ways have the same kind of impact as the printed invention of the printing press or the industrial revolution, all of those things sort of rank up in the same level of impact on human society. And to a large extent, Lenin was very much responsible for it. He wasn't the only player. I mean, you can't build something, uh, an invention really that looks like the internet by being one person. You have to create an environment where those things can develop. And I think that's what happened at UCLA. But I think Len was one of the, the sort of driving forces there that brought the right people together to allow this to, to, to evolve into what it is. And there was some earlier work which came up with some of the concepts before the Rand Corporation by Paul Barron, but he was also a UCLA student. Now, I'm not promoting UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of the matter is that's where it all started. USC took it over later at ISI, right, and actually ran the, network, ran the internet until it was commercialized in the 90s. But uh, so we're really honored to have Len here. And I really enjoyed working with him in my PhD. As I said, I worked on Packet Radio. But the, uh, the, the group of colleagues that I had there uh, were, were very uh, excellent people who have made tremendous contributions in this area as well due to the leadership. We unfortunately lost one of those colleagues just two weeks ago. It's Mario Jailer. Some of you may have heard of him. He was a professor at UCLA. Unfortunately, he uh, had a long battle with pancreatic cancer in the past. And so we had a reunion for him uh, just last, was last week, no, the weekend before. And uh, many of his old colleagues came back, and it was nice to meet them, unfortunate for the sad occasion. But he was a huge contributor to the field as well. So Len went on, and as I said, continued to work for many years. And I think he's had over 45, maybe close to 50 PhD students that have worked with him in many different areas related to the use of networking technology and how it can be applied. He's also done some fundamental, fundamental work in, in queuing theory, which some of you may have been exposed to. You may have even heard of the final independence assumption, which perhaps you'll touch on today, maybe not. But I think um, one of the things that I found from his, his teaching style, and also my interactions with him in research, was whenever you went in with some new set of results that you thought were really cool, you'd say, but what does it all mean? So you'd have this curve that you carefully plotted like during a simulation, and you'd say, but what are the asymptotes? And you know, what's the slope of this thing here? You always wanted to understand what the core essence of your result was, not just the numbers or the theory, the mathematical formula that you came out with, but understanding what was behind it. And so I was trying to drive towards getting a simple understanding of the significance of your results. And so that made a big impression on me, and it's something I've carried forward in my career with the students that I've interacted here, both in my classes and the PhD students that I've had. And I think he's going to talk a little bit today, perhaps, about some of those results. At least the title of this talk advertises that. He's going to talk about some simple, but doesn't mean they're not fundamental and important results. So thanks again for coming, Len, and let me hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be here to give this to every distinguished lecture to such a fine audience of standing room, etc. Um, just a comment about the internet and its start. I want to make an announcement that this October 29th is the 50th anniversary of the launching of the first message on was, was then the internet, the internet, now the internet. We have a big celebration, and you're all, and you're all invited. You see the announcement. Serious. Come. It's going to be a rather interesting event with some of the people who are very important places. So, as John said, I want to talk about some simple results. Um, this won't be a deep lecture. It's, the idea is to try to give some of the people in bleaches back there <laughs> um, on scholarship uh, some ideas as to some of the ways to look at research and, and maybe make, make some simple things. So, let's talk with one of our idols, Claude Shannon. He had an approach to research. These are quotes from his ideas as to what it takes to be a good researcher. And that that's the man, Lord Channel. Everybody here should know about him and if you don't tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so he talked about how you do creative thinking and what, what kind of capabilities do you need? Well, you need training experience. Hopefully you'll get that here. You need intelligence, hopefully you came with that here. <laughs> you need curiosity if you didn't come with it, it's going to be developed in your time here. And be critical, don't be satisfied, ask good questions and try to improve the things you do. Enjoy doing it, 
and you get your first result, those are the bleachers again, you'll feel a thrill, and it'll set the stage for your ability to, in fact, continue that. Tricks. Always have tricks. Simplify things. That's the sort of title of what I'm talking about today. Strip things down. Strip it way down. In fact, remember Einstein's wonderful quote? He said, make every problem as simple as possible, but no simpler. <laughs> and that's a very wise statement, and it's some, a, a guideline you should use. Find another problem that looks similar to what you just did. Maybe there's a clue there. Maybe it'll help you. Restate it in different ways. Generalize your own results. You got a result. Well, how broad is it? Now remove some assumptions, and maybe it extends on its own. Take baby steps. Don't have to take giant steps. And we'll take a giant step later, as you see. And try to reverse the problem. Maybe claim that the thing you're trying to find is the problem itself, and the problem is the solution. Try tricks. Poke at it in every dimension you can. Try to extract and approach the problem. And core channel is brilliant. So let me go over some simple results. I want to get a kind of general message across when I'm all done. It'll keep reappearing. Uh, these are not deep results. Um, but they kept popping up as I was going along in my research. So, data traffic is mercy and asynchronous, as we all know. This is the result of the 1960s. So what, is, what does it mean to be uh, mercy and asynchronous? Well, it's got some nasty problems. For example, the demand that comes in won't necessarily tell you when they want access to some resource. And you don't know how much they're going to need when they come. And they almost never need it. Or when they ask for it, they want it right now. <laughs> And that's a very difficult kind of source to provide service to. And so what do we do with that? Well, when more than one person asks for a resource at the same time, it's typically a conflict. And the trick is, how do you resolve conflicts when two people want the same thing at the same time? There's a number of solutions. One is a nice civilized solution called queuing. Two people want it, one of them gets it, the other one has to wait. Another is splitting. Two people want it, give a little bit to each. Another one is blocking. One gets it, the other doesn't. And last smash it. Two people want it, nobody gets it. <laughs> That's called CSMACD. Right? Either. So these are sort of the canonical ways. There's mixes of all of these. But a very nice one, my favorite, is queuing. And of course, this is the way the British spell with the extra E. <laughs> Five vowels in a row. Like crazy friends. <laughs> it's not the only word, it turns out. There's another word called meowie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only two I know. But at any rate, uh, we're going to do queuing. Now, queuing is really wonderful because it's, uh, it's a perfect resource sharing system. In particular, it does that because it it only serves whatever work is there right now. It doesn't wait around for something that's not yet there. And it doesn't smash, it gives it one at a time. So it's a very nice resolution for conflicting demands. So let's talk about a queuing system and ask ourselves how fast can you serve someone. Well, in most queuing systems, it's assumed that the server can only debate, work at the rate of one second per second. A human clerk can't deliver more than one second of service in a second. Example, humans being served by a human clerk. So here's a queue. You wait here, you get served here, you leave. Things come in at some rate, let's call it lambda, customers per second. They need so many seconds of service, we'll call that X bar. Here they are, coming in, being served by a human. That's the situation up there. On the other hand, let's replace humans with data technology, the kinds of systems we have today. And let's assume there's a bunch of files that want to be served by a communications link. And assume the communications link has a capacity of C bits per second, and each file has, uh, on the average of exactly, so many bits, say one of a few bits. In that case, the service time is the number of bits to be served divided by bits per second per second. But notice, oh, and then the response time is what you want to find. How long do you spend in the spelling system? What's important is we've introduced a free parameter here. We didn't have that up here. Human has one second per second. 
Now we can make this service happen as fast as we want. And the question is, what are the consequences? Is there something to be learned? So let's see. Let's look at a basic cue called the MM1 cue. For those of you who don't know, my explanation will help you. <laughs> but the M means Poisson arrivals. The first one, the second M, means it's exponentially distributed service with a single server. So things come in from Poisson process that can be served. Lambda is the arrival rate. One of them is the average number of bits per message. C is the capacity in bits per second. So the average service time is the average number of bits per message divided by bits per second gives you seconds per message. That's how long it takes a message to be served. And we'd like to define a utilization factor, which is basically lambda times the average service time. This number can't exceed one. It represents the efficiency with which you use the server. So if rho is a half, the server is busy half the time and idle half the time. So the efficiency is a half. Okay. Now, the response time is what we want to solve. The mean response time. And it turns out to be this. Very easy to to, to uh, calculate. That's the famous MM1 equation. And I'm going to change that slightly by multiplying divided by lambda, so we get this expression in terms of rho. And that response time typically looks like this versus rho. Push too hard, you spend a long time waiting. Many systems behave this way. Not necessarily MM1, but they give you a longer response time as you try to load it more heavily. Now let's scale it up. Let's see what happens. Let's talk about economy of scale. I want to compare two systems. First, a system like this, and the response time is something. Now here it is again, but I'm going to double the throughput, and I'm going to double the capacity. And it's going to have some response time. So let's think about that. I have a system with so much throughput, so much capacity, and so much response time. I'm going to double the throughput and double the capacity. The big question is, what happens to the response time? So let's take a vote. How many think it stays the same? How many think it goes up? How many think it goes down? I'm not thinking. You're not thinking. <laughs> well, the fact is, it goes down. And it drops by a factor of two. And if I scale by a factor of 1,000, the response time improves by a factor of 1,000. That's important from a systems and engineering point of view. Because that parameter C is something we can play with. OK. So it's an economy of scale principle. This is what I just said. If you scale things up at the same factor, you reduce the response time. Or you can scale it up more slowly while holding the response time fixed. And in fact, you can increase the efficiency. Let's look what all this is. You can improve all three of these. You can improve the response time, improve the throughput, and improve the efficiency all at the same time. Look like you're getting a free lunch here. Because that's one of the principles I want to, want to expose here now. So that's the expression we had for the mean response time. Let's solve that equation for rho in terms of t. And now let's plot the efficiency rho versus the throughput, lambda. And that equation up there says the function of t is going to look like that. It's a function of lambda, it's going to look like that. And that response time happens to be a value of 1. You have a whole family of response time. So what's the property of these yellow curves? You've got a constant response time. Throughput's increasing. Efficiency's increasing as you move up here. Or you can follow that blue line. What's going on with the blue line? Response time is improving. It's going down, 10 down to 1. Throughput's increasing, and the efficiency is constant. That's another kind of trade if you can. But you can have all three. You can follow the red line. Notice you've got, essentially, Response time improving, you're going down these curves, improving the throughput, and improving the efficiency. It looks like it's a free lunch, and in some sense it is. Now, to be honest with you, queuing theorists for half a century had no idea this was the case, because they didn't think it could speed up the server. It was a human server. But in fact, from an engineer, from a networking point of view, you want to know what. So let's look at some architectures that take, take advantage of that. Here's a whole bunch of little systems, queuing systems. There's n of them. And I've taken the total capacity C and divided it equally, and the total throughput divided it equally. And they're all separate systems. 
and you can calculate the response time for this. What's wrong with this system? What's wrong is there may be somebody waiting on queue here, and that server is idle, and he can't use it. So let's at least merge the queues. So anybody on queue, if there's ever an idle server, gets to use it. And it turns out that the blue system is always better than the red system for the intuitive reason and, in fact, mathematically. Now, let's ask something else. What's the optimum number of channels to use here? How big should n be? It's a free parameter I can play with it. And the answer is one. Easily proved, simple result, something to remember. And it says we make one fat channel looks like that. Now, it's not always true that this is better than that. It depends upon a statistic about the variance. But generally, it is true. Most of the time, it's true. OK. Now let's scale everything up. Let me make a second row here where everything is scaled up by a factor of n. Well, guess what? Everything on this line is a factor of n better than anything above it, for the reason I showed you before. And of course, the same idea here. You move from here to here, that's better than moving here. It's usually better. So that, that's, again, an engineering uh, result that comes out of some, some simple calculus. Let's talk about data networks. I'll just show you some very simple structures. Let's take a general data network, arbitrary topology. <coughs> Let's define some things. How long does it take you to send a message to this network, on average? That's a question of importance in network design. Let's assume on the i channel, you have a traffic lambda i. Let's assume the throughput of the system I'll call gamma, the total throughput, so many messages per second. And let's assume the time that you spend waiting for and using this channel is a number ti. That's the average delay waiting for this channel. And I want to calculate this thing in terms of these parameters. And it turns out that's the answer. A very simple result. It's, it's an exact equation. It's a key equation for network delay. OK. Let me prove that to you. This one is a very simple proof. First of all, I have to tell you a thing called Little's result, which most of you must know. It says the average number of the system is equal to the throughput times the average time in the system. And let's recognize that the average number in this system is the sum of all the guys in each line, in each queue waiting on, waiting in the system. So the sum of the yellow queues is the total number in the system. But each of these is a Little's result, ni equals lambda i ti. Very simple, now plug it back in. You get this, and that's the result. Two line proof. And by the way, I didn't say Poisson once. I didn't say exponential once. Any ergodic system behaves that way. It's a very general, exact result. It doesn't mean your problem is over because you've got to be able to find this value. And that requires things like the independence assumption that John mentioned before. But this is the approach to getting the response time for that list. So, as a result of that kind of study, some principles came out of the design of networks. First of all, that resource sharing is a good thing. You have bursting demands, you want to have them share. And how do they share? Only sign a resource to data that's present. Examples are message switching, packet switching, polling. I ask you, do you need it? No, you don't get it. If you need it, you get it. One at a time you get it. If you don't need it, I pass right by. Or even asynchronous TDM. Many ways, it turns out the internet uses this. Didn't have to. It's got some properties, good and bad. Could have been message switching, could have been something else. Package which it happens to be the thing that the internet uses. Second, the economy of scale. I just showed you before, the answer is bigger is better. Gather things up, a lot of traffic and a lot of capacity. Gather them all together you can. And last, I haven't talked about this, but the idea of distributed control is important. When you don't have any single node controlling the total network, you can't do that for a lot of reasons. It's too vulnerable, it has too much traffic to handle, it takes too long to spread information around. And we're able to show that it's efficient, it's stable, it's robust, it's full power, and believe it or not, it works. Now, people might think if you have a distributed control of the network, what's going to make sure it settles into a reasonable place? You control that. So this came out of that early uh, response time uh, analysis. 
Now let's look at the cost of that. Suppose you do all your design, you even optimize it. There's a lot of optimization. John referred to the fact that we spent a lot of time optimizing the topology, the capacity sum, and the routing, and all the rest. When you do that, you can actually find what kinds of networks you develop. If you plot cost versus throughput, it turns out to be a profile like that. It just turns out that way. Now you look at that and say, well, what is that telling me, as John asked us to mention? Well, suppose I want to build a small network. A small network is one with a little bit of throughput and a little bit of cost. But if you look at the slope of this line, the slope of this line has units of dollars per unit of throughput. If I look at a big network out here, the slope of that same line is smaller, which means that I'm getting more throughput per dollar I spend. Andy, not because of the uh, of the infrastructure costs. That's part. Of, yeah, there's a there's a there's, you know you got to before you do anything you got to put something down there. But the, the net result is it says build large networks, move out there, get that slope as small as you can. You know that that's the thing you take away from it once you see it. And we're going to keep coming back to that concept over and over again in my presentation. So distributed processing, another kind of approach. Let's look at a general series parallel processing network, not a, a, a data network, it's a processing network. I want to get jobs processed. Suppose I have an arrival of jobs, and they need to be processed. And the way I've got this laid out here is M different possible series channels, and the K channel has N sub K um, processors with a computational speed C. Each one has the same amount, CK. And the total traffic is lambda. I'm splitting up these M pieces. And total capacity is this. So you got this, and you got this, and you can build an architecture. You can pick N sub K, you can pick M, you can pick K, etc. So, or the response time for each of these is a well-known number. It's basically a, a, another um, MM1 assumption Q in theory. So you know how long it takes to pass through each of these. And you want to get these jobs through and ask for two response time. What's the total response time? Get through there. And let's do the single node. The single node has all the thru throughput and all the capacity. You think that's a good thing or a bad thing? One node, all the traffic, all the capacity. Good or bad? Come on. <laughs> good, I've been saying. Big or bad? Put it all together. So the equation is very simple. It's, uh, it's given that way, then my one, maybe you're done. Let's look at the gen general series parallel system, the one I just showed you. The answer is obviously this. This amount of time per hop, that many hops, that's the fraction, I see that many hops, sum it up and you get this. And let's compare different architectures. And I want to take the ratio of the thing you look at compared to the thing we know is best, the single node. And it turns out to be this equation. So now we can make some computations. These are the definitions row, obviously. Special cases. The pure tandem. One chain, equal capacities, broken up into n pieces. Make the calculation, guess what? The ratio is n times as big. In other words, you're spending n times as long in the system as you would if you ganged them all together. It's equal to the number of pieces you broke it up into. That's the thing I want you to remember. Let's go to the pure parallel system. It looks like that. You know what the answer is going to be. The ratio is the number of pieces I broke it up into. Let's go to a symmetric series parallel system. M rows, each the same. What's the result going to be? The number of pieces I've broken up into. Because the mathematics tells you, but the intuition is breaking it up is not a good idea. In fact, if you take uniform traffic and break it up like this again, arbitrary lengths, arbitrary capacities, but you break the traffic up into equal pieces, you get again the number of pieces you've broken up into. So it keeps telling us bigger is better, make as few as you can. And once you see things like this in the processing case and in the networking case, sort of tells you what a topology should look like. If you make a topology, 
where as much traffic as you can is put on a channel and as few hops as you need. Well, you can't necessarily do that in a real network, but you try to move your architecture, the topology, the capacity assignment, and your routing to achieve that. Bigger and fewer is better in this case. Okay. Packet radio, John mentioned we were working on that. Lots of great work took place in this period, but it was too early. Technology was not ready. Uh, the packet radius we're dealing with was 25 pounds, cubic foot, took 25 watts. Can't lug that around. We're doing better these days. In the 90s, and et cetera, we began to shrink them down thanks to companies like Andy's, a company where they made the chips small, tiny, light, cheap, and fast. So let's see what happens. Well, I'm not going to give you much results here. I'm just going to tell you. I would often give a lecture with this in the 70s. It's a picture of an individual sitting in the middle of Central Park at a device, and there's not a wire in the picture. There's no power, and there's no communication link directly. There's wireless applied. And yet in the 70s, we're talking about what you carry around in your pocket right now. Didn't have the whole vision, but the concept was there. And so we began to study how can we do wireless communications in the mesh network, uh, with the various access schemes, various protocols, etc. And one of the issues was this, the old slotted aloha problem. Slotted aloha turns out to have a behavior like this. This is basically the backlog for some throughput. And the only thing I want to point out, because this is an electrical engineering thing on that, right? When you look at that, that looks like negative resistance. Now, when you say negative resistance, you think unstable. And indeed, once we saw that, we knew the system was going to be, and in fact, slot or lower is unstable, unless you do something to stabilize it, like binary exponential back off, etc. So already we had to, and we did the exact analysis here. Okay. Now, in these packet radio systems, you have people wanting access to the channel to communicate. And it's stochastic. You don't know when the demands are coming. So they're going to bump into each other. You've got to basically resolve those conflicts. So in the wireless world, as well as in the wired world, we've got degradation due to queuing. Unpredictable arrival times, unpredictable service times. But that's not bad enough. It gets much worse. Because you don't know who's on queue. You can't, in a queue, I see who's on the queue with me, and I get behind one, I'll get in front of them, whatever. In a wireless world, I don't know who's out there trying to compete with me. So I have to pay a price to organize that queue. And there's three kinds of prices. Either you bump into each other, or some people stay idle when they shouldn't, or you have to send a lot of messages wasting the channel to control it on And I'll give you three examples of the kinds of things we study. No control, for example, Aloha, they're going to bump into each other, but you don't have to pay that price. Static control, which means you're ahead, ahead of time you assign it. There's no collisions, you made sure of that. But sometimes, when it's your turn, you have nothing to send. So it's idle capacity. There's no control over it, you do that once and you're done. Or dynamic control, where you reserve things. No collision, no idle capacity. A lot of control over it to make sure everything is working well. So you're going to pay something. And we examined all those cases and there's various traders for different protocols. Now one interesting question though is, if you wanted to have a multi-hop system, how should you move to a packet radio network? Here's an arbitrary packet radio network. Those are the base stations. And you want to go from red to green. How, how much of a radius, how large a signal should I send? Well, I could do it in one hop send a very powerful signal of each of the sky in one hop, but I'm wiping out half the United States and half the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> but I get there in one hop. <laughs> or I could be a little more reasonable, take shorter radii, don't bother as many people, but it takes me more hops. So the question is, what should be the giant step I take? Very simple model. John and I worked on this considerably. I, I won't give away the title of our paper at that time. Maybe I'll go Multi-hop, each hop is going to cover distance R. 
total distance you want to go is d, and d is much bigger than r to make it simple. Now, bigger r, more interference that's bad, fewer hops that's good, and vice versa, of course. Less interference with smaller r, but more hops that's bad. So let's set up the equation. If t of r is the response time when you choose a radius r, each hop goes you that much on the average, then clearly the total delay is the delay per hop times the number of hops. And without even explaining yet what this, giving you an equation for this, it's pretty clear you want to choose r to minimize the total delay, and that's the condition. <coughs> okay, what does that tell us? Suppose the response time for a hop of radius r looks like that, or something like that. Here's the condition. The answer is the optimum point is right at the tangent of this curve. That's the optimum radius. And that was a 1975 paper. The point is, this is not an exact analysis. It's, it's made a lot of assumptions. But it's telling you something about how to find an arbitrary function. In fact, if this is a bumpy, bumpy function, just find that point where the slope is minimum. And that will be the optimum. Very simple result for what looks like a complex problem. Next thing, we're going to come back to those ideas in just a moment. Here's another way we're going to see it. Flow control and power. So, flow control. Here's a network. There are routing procedures in networks. Now, routing procedures are not that hard to design, but they're very hard to analyze. So be it. Flow control. What is flow control? Flow control is any constraint you put between the input and the output. That's controlling the flow. For example, suppose we're sending messages through the system. And suppose I put the following constraint in. I say, the order in which the messages come in should be the same order in which they come out. How many would vote for that? How many want to vote against that? Well, those who voted for the two people, I think. <laughs> 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 you made a contract. And suppose the network one day loses one message. It will never deliver anything again because you said it can't. Because everything else is out of order. And it's your fault. <laughs> but you said, no, I didn't mean that. You should have kept a copy somewhere, blah, blah, blah. The point is, any time you put a constraint of input and output, you're endangering yourself of not being able to meet that constraint, and something's going to clear. Well, the internet behaves that way now. There are all kinds of flow control constraints distributed all over the protocol. And today, somebody adds another new one of their own that can interact with the others in unknown ways. I guarantee the internet has faults built into it right now. If the right conditions were excited, it'll take it down. It'll take down the portion. So let's talk about flow control. It's an important issue. They're hard to design. They're almost impossible to analyze. But you need them. And for sure, they're going to give it to you. They're going to get you one way or another. OK, so let's talk about flow control. There's an input. There's a capacity network to take the carry traffic. And there's something that comes out. And the difference, of course, is what comes in, less what is lost, than what comes out. So let's look at that. Let's look at how much you get out for how much you put in. I told you this is not a very sophisticated talk. <laughs> well, this is good. Whatever you put in, this is a 45 degree. Whatever you put in comes out. We're doing well. Until you hit the capacity of the network. Okay, you can't send more than that. So you got to flatten out there. And that's what the picture looks like. And that is, in some sense, the ideal curve under that one constraint, network capacity. And if you try to drive in more input, you're going to lose the difference between that line and this line. It's going to get lost somehow. Now, if you do nothing and run a network without any kind of control, you don't even get the idea. You typically get a behavior like this. It's doing fine. Then you get a little bit of trouble. It reaches a peak. And then the more you put in, the less you get out. Because things are bumping into each other more and more and more. Whenever you get that decline, it means there's some, something being lost in the network. Can you think of any other situation where you see this kind of behavior in everyday life? Four or five. Four or five. <laughs> 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 which, which, which is exactly right. And this is a well-known phenomenon. And 
and uh, traffic engineers have been studying this for a long time. Now, if you want to be conservative, and if you put some kind of control in a very conservative part, won't let too much in, you won't do as well as the red, but you won't collapse either. So that's one approach. Or if you want to do dynamic control, you do a little better than green, and you won't collapse also. So these are the kinds of things you try to develop. Many dynamic flood control schemes are uh, possible. But I want to look more at the response time. So let's focus on that. Let's look at response time versus throughput. I'm slightly changing the notation on you now, but this is the amount of output you get for that much input. The difference is the loss. So let's focus on throughput now. Here's my nice curve. Now here's a big question. Where should you operate? You want to operate there? Boy, you get a lot of throughput, but you get a lousy response time. The alternative is wonderful response time, lousy throughput. Where should you operate? You're trading off seconds for efficiency. They're not commensurate. So we have to invent a new metric. The metric we're going to invent is something we'll call power. It's an interesting thing. It's a ratio of throughput to response time. We want to make it as cheap as possible. A lot of throughput to response time. And there's the equation. Now, suppose we do that. Oh, we yes, part. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, then it looks like guys are a little. I mean, I like y'all guys. Oh, but you I know. don't like them too much. I like them. Now, So. So the question is, we'd like to maximize power. This is an arbitrary metric, but let's see if there's something interesting about it. Let's look at this point right here. If you operate here, look at the slope again. It's one over power. It's response time over throughput, which is the opposite of power. And guess what? It's the same equation as we had earlier for the uh, giant stepping. And that's the optimum point right there, the tangent. Now, agreed, it's an arbitrary <coughs> metric, so maybe it's not interesting. But basically, it says a line out of the origin has a minimum slope that's place to operate. And if it looks like that, then the answer is there. And if it's discontinuous, non-convex, not differentiable, same answer. Find the line out of the origin that has a smaller slope that comes to the curve. Okay. Now, let's dig a deeper. John said, you always have to ask him, what did I just learn from this? It turns out for MM1, that point is where exactly this, on average, is one in the system. The average is exactly one. Now, that's a very interesting accident. When this arbitrary metric we chose, that's what comes out. The question is why. So let's take a very simplistic point of view, and here we're trying to make things as simple as possible. Let's look at a queue. There's a server. There's a guy being served. If you add more people while he's being served, you've done a foolish thing. But they're sitting here waiting. And they can't get the service until they leave. So if you wanted to minimize the, max, the response time while maximizing the throughput, your intuition says, don't let anybody in there until he leaves. And then put another one in. If you had the joint, you'd feed them in exactly one at a time. And always one at a time. Don't leave the server idle. Give them one whenever you need. For any, for any definition of optimality, that's going to be true. Exactly one. Now this says, basically, Keep the pipe just full. That's especially for a deterministic system, you can do that. You know exactly, you can put one in per second, it takes one second to serve, just keep it going in a deterministic fashion. Now, the intuition says exactly one person, but the stochastics, the randomness says you can't get one person. That's deterministic reasoning. We can't get that. But our result a moment ago said on average do that. Sometimes you have two in the system, shucks, 
Sometimes nobody in the system shuts. On average, keep just one in the system. That's the way to load it. Maximum power you want this. And it turns out at that point, it's much interesting. You're getting only half the throughput and eating twice the delay. That's the optimum case for MM1. Now, what's interesting about this result is that could, could have been an arbitrary queuing function. In queuing systems, when we study how many are in the system on average, we sometimes think of 20, 30, 50, 1,000 people in the queue. Big numbers. This says keep it way down. Don't run the load up to get big queues. In fact, in this case, you'll get typically a very small queue. You get basically a queue of one. OK. See, that's funny. How about MG1, a more general service time distribution? For the same picture, that's the MM1 curve. That's the optimum. You go to some of the MG1 curves, more statistics there. Turns out the optimum is where I'm showing you construction-wise. Guess what? That locus of optimal curves of the whole family of MG1 is exactly at 1 on average. Again, keep it down, keep it small. On average, make it exactly 1. Which means keep that server full. Keep that pipe, that server, just full. No fuller and no less. OK, so here we are again. The DD1, totally deterministic. Deterministic looks like that. Exactly like true. Well, where's the optimum point? The point beta. How many in the system there? Exactly one. It works for that case. Obviously, that deterministic reasoning here help. I'm trying to lead you to the idea of using deterministic reasoning as an extreme point to give you a clue as to where you should be. It's a very, with deterministic systems, it's very easy to make calculations. OK. It's the third time we've seen that darn thing this morning. Afternoon. We saw it here with giant stepping a little moment ago. We saw it just now with power. And we saw it earlier with the economy of scale and effort. Get that slope as small as you can. Of course, is there a general case here? Is this is accident or something more fundamental here? Well, interesting, if you look at this measure, that's a bad thing. You want to minimize that. Same thing here. Same thing here, you want to keep the cost down. Horizontal axis, it's a measure of good. Measure of good. So, generalization. General case. Take any bad function, which is a function of this good function. This could be investment versus profit. Response time versus throughput. A whole bunch of stuff. And it can be anything. Where's the answer? If you sit up there, the slope is bad over good. The inverse of that is good over bad. You want to maximize this, which means minimize the slope. I've said that now four times. And the answer is right there. And that applies to any system at all. It's well beyond queuing theory and networks and all the rest. OK. I'll break the call slope is minimal. Now let's apply that back to queuing systems to get another way to view some of this. Power is, I'm, I'm going to redefine it slightly, make it normalized throughput over normalized response time, which means that's an example of good over bad. In the case of queuing system, it's the efficiency rho, normalized throughput, over the normalized response time. The minimum response time is one over mu, so t over one over mu. mu. It's normalized response time, normalized throughput. And it's always less than one because rho is always less than one and mute is always greater than one. Now, Lil's result I told you before was lambda times t. Lambda is rho mu. So n bar gives you this. Now, notice both of these equations are only a function of rho and t and normalization mu. It doesn't matter what queuing system you have, mg1, gg1, ggm, I don't care. These equations hold. So let's look at the plots versus that. Let's plot mu t versus rho. And let's find power for any queuing system at all. There's the expression. Simply solve that for mu t versus rho. Well, mu t versus rho, it's linear in rho. 
So this is the family of curves, with all of the different power curves from one down towards zero. That should be a point one. I'm sorry, this should be a point one. Same time, let's instead of looking at power, let's look at average number and system for any queuing system. That's the equation. Solve for t. It's inverse on row, it's hyperbolas. That's the family of average number and system. And there they are. Let's put them all on one plot now. This is for any queuing system. Any queuing system. And it, it shows two key parameters, the average number and the power. Now, instead of doing mu, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to invert this. Yeah. Now, why did I do that? Because the range of values goes from 0 to 1, 0 to 1. It's on the 1 by 1 pictures, all contained in one. That is what I like to call the universal power flow. For any queuing system at all. Another way to think of the way these systems behave. It's a very powerful description. It's sort of like a Bowie flag. It gives you uh, a lot of information on one picture, independent of the particular system. Now, let's do it for MG1. I'm finally going to get to a practical example in just a moment. For MG1, I've shown you these are essentially the power curve, the dash line. This is the only one of the average numbered system I'm showing you for good reason. And this is MD1, that's MM1, that's one of the ME21s, another ME21. And of course, the optimum point happens to be at these points here. Why? Well, if you're going to lie along this curve and you want to maximize power, just like in the Lagrangian, you want to find the largest power curve to which is tangent. And it turns out they are tangent at that point. And interestingly enough, that line is the line n bar equals 1. And we've done it before. The optimum point for mg1 lies here. You do this for any set of cubic terms you want. Now, an application, TCP. Let's think about TCP for the networking folks here. <coughs> the TCP flow sends data across the network along some particular uh, in this particular session and returns an app. And the flow control is adjusted so that you don't overload <coughs> the pipe too much. And if you look at the way it's done up to now, flow control is basically on a packet loss base. And it basically interprets packet loss as congestion, which is a funny thing. And it has, you know, the additive increase and multiplicative decrease. If you look at the way in which you pump things in versus time in, say, Reno or Vegas or any of those, you pump really hard till you blow up and you back off. And you pump really hard and you back off. This sawtooth of behavior is typical of TCP and B. And it's a bad behavior, just driving things until they break, repairing them, driving them until they break again, which is sort of nuts. It should be based on what I just told you about, keep the pipe just full and no full. And that particular work is something I did back in 1978 and 79, where this was the theme that came out of it. Well, recently, the uh, folks doing the uh, TCP design for the Google networks like YouTube, they recognized that this philosophy was a lot better than this. And so they were adopting this. They run a YouTube network right now, which is what I'm going to show you. And it's working much better. It's a much simpler system to use. So let's consider what we saw before, round trip time versus delivery rate. I'm changing the words now to match what's used in the TCP world. Well, there's a round trip propagation delay. The minimum time to go there and come back, due to processing times, due to speed of light, etc. And it's pretty clear that the round trip time can't ever be any less than the minimum round trip time. And typically, there's a bottleneck bandwidth somewhere in the network along that pipe. You can't ever get more bandwidth than that. That's inaccessible. So you're going to live in this region here. So let's watch TCP works. We're going to start pumping in some data. So it's pumping and pumping until it gets to this point. And then all that throughput's going through. This is a very simple model. Once you get to the bottom of the bandwidth, you keep pumping, what's going to happen? You're going to build up queues. Your response time's going to increase. So you start climbing up here. 
until what happens, you hit the buffer limit, and then what happens? Packet loss. Oops, let's back it off. Let's start climbing again. Let's back it off. This is where TCP lives. That's a dumb place to live. You should be living right here. But bandwidth and minimum delay if this was the profile. Keep the pipe just full and no full. And if you recognize it's not really deterministic, but it typically behaves like this, then where should you operate? Where the tangent is. Right there. And in fact, uh, that's being experimented with. Now, if you look at these networks and you try to use this principle, there's a summary of power for networks, which leads to the kind of result I just showed you. First of all, it says, in all of the things I'm going to show you now, the average number system should be basically the well-known bandwidth delay product. Basically, minimum delay, maximum bandwidth. First thing is, for any DD1 system, an old MG1 system, we saw this before, the average number should be 1. I didn't show you this, but I, actually I did show you that. Okay, next. For parallel DDK, but in more particular, K DD1 systems in series, or K MD1 systems in series, again, the average number should be K. What does this number mean? You got a, a pipe of length K hops. Put one person in each. Keep that person, keep each of those people busy, and shift, and shift, and shift. And if it's exponential, then on average you do that. Put, pump in as many as you have. Any series that with heterogeneous DD1 or heterogeneous MD1, almost the same thing. Um, let me back up here. The average number system should be almost the number that you have in the pipe. But if they're unequal, heterogeneous, then it's this sum, which is typically less than K. Remember, this is a queuing system. You're trying to keep, you don't want to go to thousands of people in the queue. You want one or less in this layer system. And that's the kind of philosophy you want in the TCP design. Keep the pipe just full and no full. And it all comes out of this deterministic reasoning and this interesting power method for you to do. So, let's slightly generalize power. Instead of this definition I gave you, suppose you put an exponent in the group. Suppose you love throughput more than you despise response. Then make R bigger than 1. And vice versa, make all less than one. Well, a very nice and curious result comes out, use the expression. At maximum power, the average number system for MM1 is R. A lovely, simplistic result. You're willing to put more in the system if, you, if, if R is bigger than one, because two plus more. Than one. That doesn't quite generalize, but it's an interesting curiosity. So, finally, some guidelines from research for the folks in the back. I have five golden rules, five golden guidelines for research. I'll give you the names now to everyone. Conduct a 100-year test. Don't fall in love with your model. Beware of mindless simulation. Understand your own results and look for G, that's fine. So let's look at the first one. Richard Hatton, brilliant guy. He wrote a terrific paper you all should read. You and your research. Look at him on the way. March 7, 1986. He asked the following question. He said, why is it that so few scientists do significant work? And they're forgotten in a lot of them. His answer was, if you don't work on important problems, you're probably not going to do important work. So, relevant to that, he once asked me, what progress of work that's being done today will be remembered a thousand years from now? What do you remember about things a thousand years ago? How many things? <laughs> Maxwell's equation. I mean, how many things do you The dark ages. The dark ages. <laughs> 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 we were all there, right? <laughs> so let's say that, that's, that's a bold question, but how about a simple one? How about 100 years from now? Will you work be remembered 100 years from now? How about 10 years from now? Do something that's going to have some impact, some meaning. Don't piddle around with tiny little problems. Okay? If you have a choice. That's the first uh, guideline. Uh, the modeling process. We all spend our time, doubly in CS, making models of the real world. Here's the real world. Make a mathematical model. What do you do next for your dissertation? You try to solve the model. You can't always do that. 
Exactly. You know, that's, that's the second point. The first point is make an approximation. But a better point, as Andy says, is change the damn model. Don't fall in love with your model. You may make a simpler model here, which is more easy to solve, and most of all, the final loop is, it's got to match the real world. You may come up with a better match here by changing the model than before. So, and, and for example, think deterministic, perhaps. Think uh, approximate. You can change the world as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I think> you <laughs> <pressure that. laughs> So that's, that's, I don't know what that tells you, but I, I think it is, you do have these two capabilities. You can twiddle here. Simulation. We've all done simulation. You see pictures like this in the literature all the time. Now getting back again, exactly what John said before. Get pictures like this. <laughs> I'll give us a, a student a problem. Here's a model, give me the analysis. It can't quite do it. Come back to the simulation. I said, okay, uh, what if I double the throughput? What happens? Oh, I'm simulating. <laughs> That's called mindless simulation. And I believe computers are the worst enemy of good critical thinking. It's too easy to do that instead of doing what I'm talking about here. And as John said, when you get a picture like this, the first thing you should ask is, what is the meaning of that slope? Why? What are the parameters in the underlying model that give you that slope? And what about this intercept? Or what about the asymptotic value? Or what about what looks like a really important point? What's the meaning of this thing here? Why did it break there? There's a lot you can learn by asking questions like that. So again, ask the obvious questions and don't just keep simulating without any understanding. Third, understand your own results. Think about the result you got. And ask what is the teacher made. As I say, try deterministic or simple models of training behavior. Why does filling the pipe make sense? We found out by going through it today. Ask questions of that sort. Think about upper and lower bounds. Try to bound the problem. Take limits. You know what happens when it goes to infinity or starts at zero. Does your answer match those? No, your answer's wrong. So just, and of course, look at the extreme cases. Okay, last, look for G, that's funny. Don't ignore strange results. Don't throw away outliers. Maybe that's where the interesting thing is. In fact, that's often where the goal lies. You know, don't assume it's a mistake. Maybe there's something there. And as you know, most discoveries are not accompanied by Eureka, but hmm, that's funny. That's interesting, that's funny. So, we have come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Renee. We have some time for questions. Please feel free. Thank you. As usual, you're a terrific lecturer. Thank you. It's very much uh, entertaining. I'm uh, still on the second slide. <laughs> <laughs> and what you proved at the beginning is that uh, having um, a multi server can go. It was better than having n keys. If you've ever been in a bank you know, before ATM machines, you know. Um, and that's because uh, the inefficiency is that one key would be one that means the fact that you But then you, you point out that the best is to have it, is to have it. One key and one server. So you might be able to do that with data. You can't do it with people because they're sitting there. And when when the traffic is is uh, low, that one or more people will be out and then the efficiency will go down. But the trouble is having a single server assumes that he can work he or she can work at any speed. Possible. This and, is only for and, and in fact, what you're really doing is very little speed by having any good one. Well, I assume you could change the speed of the server because it's a computer, a communication channel, or a processor. You can't do that with But you're quite right. It's also the case that 
n equals 1 is not always the optimum for any distribution. If there's a high variance in the service time, you may get one long son of a gun in front of you on a single server, you stop it. That's why having another back door is good. And high variance cases sometimes move in that direction. So you, you, uh, your, your optimization did still... But that was, that was MM1. That was for MM1. Yes. If I can follow up on this, you know, so for example, when you're making servers, you make a server twice as fast, it costs four times as much. So it's not cost, linear. Yeah. The cost is basically not linear. So you can have a faster server, but the cost is very, very rapid. Then what how would your distribution change? Where would you Well, then you've got to put that in the performance of the um, evaluation for you. Have another. There's a whole situation about um, priority queuing. And you put in cost, cost of waiting, for example, cost of service. Um, and there's some really very lovely results there, too. Um, I, I have a paper called Optimum Driving for Q Position. Okay. And you pay, because you have a wait, a waiting cost back there. You want to pay so much. And there's many studies on this, but that's not in the budget. In fact, uh, I assume here, we looked at some of those cases, but actually, Tariff <coughs> in the ARPANET, they think called a telpack tariff. And in fact, there was an economy of scale. The higher the capacity, the less unit cost. So, the bigger was better for two Does this, so I'll just kind of ask one question. Uh, does this mean that to solve the San Diego freeway congestion problem, we should just have much faster speed limits? Or a bigger car. <laughs> By the way, there's a very interesting thing I learned just the other day. Self autonomous cars. You're going to drive people to work. Put them to work. Where's the car go? Well, you go to a cheaper parking lot, the downtown parking lot. Well, it'll circulate. And to circulate, it turns out the most efficient way to circulate is as slow as possible. So these cars will find the most congested road <laughs> and make it yet worse. So now you need economic incentives to undo that. But uh, can't quite understand. Yeah. Yes. So I come from a diff completely different background, which is fluid mechanics. And all of this actually relate a lot to the fluid mechanics, a very, very important media. Uh, and you know, the traffic flow problem. So there's a lot of hyperbolic equation aspects to it. I mean, actually, this tangent construction that we have there appear all the time. Yeah. For the traffic flow, it's very active. It's in the course there. Um, one question I wanted to ask you is, we have all these network analogs uh, in different configurations, mostly parallel. Uh, many uh, ways by which it's a disordered media uh, uh, are represented is to uh, uh, percolate network. Mm -hmm. okay? I wonder if any of this apply in this particular name. You don't want to get a percolating internet because it's very close to basically not being functional in some way. But there are possibilities in which networks are not very well connected. And then some of the properties are very different than if it is, let's say, a parallel configuration or things like that. Well, you know, the connectivity network is very often you get a hierarchical structure. Yeah. So parts of it are sparse. Uh, I don't think anybody's looked at it from percolating uh, fluid dynamics. Yeah. That's going to be interesting. interesting uh, yeah. But you're quite right. By the way, the uh, in traffic flows, you know, we sometimes get these, these shock waves. Yes, Q and Q will not predict that. Yeah. It's got to be uh, the hydrodynamics, right? fluid dynamics that predicts that, which is interesting. So there it's are. Yeah, I'm Actually, I, I believe that some hidden. Uh, yeah, uh, Conversation was handy regarding um, there's a theorem in, 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 in the area of uh, data processing that uh, we described, and a similar problem in which you have um, so a number of the things that you showed to where the threshold, you have certain fluids that in order to flow, they have to exceed a certain pressure uh, gradient, mm -hmm. so you have a flow on one side, flow rate, and on the other hand, you have the flow. The driving force, in this case, is first gradient. So you have a certain threshold for this to happen. And many of, uh, there are many parallel, actually, um, uh, results that I find to be very similar. It's kind of interesting. Well, we get the fields together. Yes. One with the problems. It's following your rules, the sort of thing, yeah. out of the process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
That assumption with independence renders the problem almost impossible. In fact, when, when I first faced that, um, and I realized that the arrival time and the service time were dependent because of the sequence, um, I had all the equations, couldn't solve it, used the independence assumption, broke it through. It took 15 years later before anybody solved that problem for two nodes in series with the same capacity. And that was not an explicit solution. Uh, the set of equations, whose solution to show you. So it's intractable from the queuing theory point of view. And then from the topological point of view, the network flow, multi-commodity network flow, as you know, are extremely hard problems to get analytic results for once you go beyond two commodities. So that whole networking problem, if you take it without any assumptions, you're dead on two fronts. So you write it something. But, but, if you make an approximation like I did, and he asked, is it a good approximation? And then you run a simulation, you have no network to test. The simulation showed, yes, they were almost on top of each other. And then you ask why, and you can understand why. The kind of splitting of independence, of dependence, and that makes you connect with it. Yes? I was sort of curious about your comment about PCP. You, you sort of feel that they went wrong with using PCP? Ask me? No, with the congestion control. Ask Van Jacobson, this is the guy who said, uh huh. 40 years ago, there was a piece of a result that basically informs Tao, and they're doing it. They're, they're changing the group, he's a Google now. So that, that sorted behavior is not desirable. But there's a remaining problem I did not address. I only showed you basically equilibrium or status, steady state results. Now, what happens when you get multiple flows? sharing the bottleneck channel, coming in and going out. How do they adjust their fair share? Or do they end up at a, at a reasonable place? That dynamic problem is being worked on now, experimentally, without it, it's not by analysis. It's a really hard problem. Would it be fair to say that the, in the, the TCP case with the, the original sort of flow control mechanisms, that they were trying to optimize the use of the expensive capacity in the network, whereas the, this what you're proposing here will actually operate at a lower overall utilization of the links, right? But capacity is much cheaper these days. So is that a fair point? They were trying to optimize, it's true, but by doing that, they had a lot of retransmissions, which then wasted capacity. But it kept yeah. the links full, which was... You know. It kept the links full of the same stuff more than once. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. So, but it looks good, because everybody was busy. So. <laughs> There's maybe one or two more questions. Okay, well thanks again, man. You really appreciate it.